welcome to the show. Um, I'm flying solo tonight because my tag team partner, Ray Turner, couldn't make it. Um, had a personal issue, so um, that's obviously totally understandable. But So Ray hopefully will join us again in a future week. Um, so the show goes out to Ray, of course. It won't quite be the same without him this week, but he's he's given me his latest picks for the sci-fi list, his next 10 films, and some notes to go along with them, which I'll read out. So, yeah, that's the deal once again this week. It's part two of our, or our rundowns, our individual lists of the top 50 favourite, our favourite science fiction movies. And that's to come in in the coming minutes. Um, also, if I have time later, I'm going to have a review of 21 Bridges, which is a new release, which I saw this week. And me and Ray have both picked a TV movie of the week, so I'll be doing that as well later on. But once again, the show is all about you. If you want to get involved with the conversation and pick some of your favourite science fiction movies... You can text 07399085508 or you can email studio at beyondradio.co.uk just if you want to say some of your favourite sci-fi movies, if you want to give maybe a top five and just comment on, on our choices as well if you feel like it. Um, also, actually, the show goes out tonight to Clive James, the critic who just passed away this week, aged 80. I know he had quite a long um, battle with illness, but he was a critic, poet, broadcaster, very well known If you know, in a lot of national newspapers and, and on TV. Um, and, yeah, one of the old school of journalists, if you like, uh, a brilliant guy, will be sadly missed. And, actually, I can highly recommend... One of his recent books, which is Play Play All, which is his engrossing look look at television box sets, where he dedicates a chapter each to to a different show and connects them to other similar shows, and yeah, just his his thoughts on them. Really, it's a really great book, and I'll be using some of it in the new year. Um, yeah, when I switch to TV, so yeah, show goes out to Clive James as well this week. Um, and so we'll we'll make a start. So we're up to number forty individually. Um, so I'll start with my number forty. It, it's a film I've I've talked about on the show before, and it's sort of the first time I'm going to have to make it clear. Then I do mean the original because there has been a remake. But my number forty is Total Recall from 1990, the Vorp, the Paul Van Hoven film. It's a take on or it's a version of Philip K. Dick's We Can Remember It For You Wholesale. Um, So we have peak era Arnie here, Arnold Schwarzenegger at at the peak of his powers. In case you don't know what the plot is, he plays construction worker Dennis Craig who decides he wants to take a trip to Mars but he finds out that there's a conspiracy to keep him from leaving his home planet and that his life could potentially be false and part of the the whole sort of conspiracy. So that's the setup. It's a really interesting film as sort of a mainstream type blockbuster because it, it's sort of this double header of this sort of romping entertainment, you know, action sci-fi, and you've got Arnie sort of on charismatic sort of form, um, looking good. Um, but also it balances that with the more serious science fiction satire sort of thing. It's, you know, it's quite a bleak sort of plot, certainly in the second half film. And it balances the two halves pretty well. There's really good effects um, which stand up really well. Some great practical effects, some futuristic ideas in there. I mean, some of the stuff on Mars in the later half of the film particularly looks impressive. You've got another really good, beautiful music by Jerry Goldsmith Um, and some really inventive ideas and sort of eccentric characters. So here I've like the talking um, cabs, for example, um, with like the robotic man sort of driving them and the automated sort of systems, but lots of eccentric sort of characters and adds on 
but I think it works because it, it sort of goes through and sticks to its premise and really pushes that near the end of the film. It's not afraid to be a darker sort of film for a mainstream film. I think that's one of the impressive things about it. You've got a decent supporting cast. I mean, my, Michael Ironside stands out as the slimy sort of villain of the PC. He's, he's very good in it. But yeah, always one I enjoy re-watching. That's Total Recall from 1990. My number 40 and Ray's number 40 as we switch lists is Minority Report, the Steven Spielberg film from 2002. Um, so Tom Cruise, Max Van Sido, Samantha Morton, really underrated actress. I think the first Spielberg film to appear on either list, and he's certainly done plenty of sci-fi. So this is an... Oh, we have, we have a link, actually, because this is also based on a Philip K. Dick, so that's... That's sort of funny how both number 40s are. Um, so um, he's put sci scientists who can predict when a murder is about to be committed so the police can get there and stop it, but still imprison the person who's about to commit it. Interesting um, philosophical debate for a Hollywood film very much the sort of themes P.K. Dick was into, what is reality, etc. So that's Ray's sort of comments on it. I've never seen Minority Report, actually. I always hear good things about it. So that's Ray's number 40. My number 39 is Silent Running from 1972. I think this is another one I did on the show. And it's directed by Douglas Chermborn, who worked on 2001. And we have Bruce Stern in one of his best roles, really, as Freeman Lowell, one of four crewmen on board, um, and he is the resident botanist so this, and um, echinist, so this is b based on, like, a space station. And he maintains the variety of plants for their eventual return to Earth and restore a nation. But the mission is called off and Lowell decides to go rogue and save the plants and the animal life. Um, so it's very much a slow burn in, again, old-fashioned science fiction of ideas. You have gorgeous dreamlike universe, beautiful cinematography. Uh, makes you think about the environment and and the themes are not heavy-handed so it doesn't sort of hit you over the head with it. it is quite sort of subtle although I think it probably does have a clear message and Joan Baez's music is enchanting and it's sort of fitting they got her because of the sort of hippie type themes um, impressively just one million it costs to make so that's a good example of a low budget um, science fiction ideas based films so silent running um i think it gets underrated yeah that's my number 39 ray's number 39 going in with a big hitter and his second spielberg film in a row jurassic park from 1993 sam neill laura dern jeff goldblum richard attenborough um, and ray says the first realistic dinosaurs on film Pretty scary, he says, which I concur, and some great set pieces, which I also concur. Yeah, I love Jurassic Park. It's really a, a big favourite of mine from my youth. It really captured my imagination and scared me a lot when I first saw it at the cinema, and I got swept along in the whole thing. Brilliant story, great characters, really great effects, and no spoilers, but it may well feature on my list to come as well. But number 39, in fact, I will challenge Ray, then it might be a bit low, but that's his 39. My 38 is the original version of The Invisible Man, and that's from 1933. It's directed by James Whale, who directed many of the Universal Monster movies. And it stars Claude Rains in the title role. And it's a really fun film. Um, Rains is like this slippery, like wicked sort of maleficent sort of presence. Um, and it's a great physical performance, you know, because he really teases the audience and he really has to, you know, spell a lot of it out through physical movements that 
His voice work is very distinct as well. I sort of liken it to almost like the Joker in Batman, that that sort of classic sort of villain um, where he's having a lot of fun with the chaos he's causing. Um, it sort of goes into the science of it a little bit as well, which is a nice little touch. Um, and the film, I think, does a good job of sort of adhering to that sort of less is more and slowly revealing the monster sort of... Um, that sort of classic convention but it's a film which has has fun with the premise and really goes for it and the villain is really entertaining in it you know the the the, the romance is sort of so so um but there's some good set pieces it, it it does some smart things um and because of the era you know 1933 obviously a lot of limitations and they done done a good job with it um working around that and making an engrossing film and i'm sure ray would be a favor of that as well as he's a big fan of older cinema so the Invis invisible man sorry from 1933 is my number 38 um yeah 38 um so Oh, oh yeah, Ray's first. Uh, see, I'm I'm getting confused because I'm reading from two lists. So Ray's number thirty-eight is T H X one one three eight, just a series of a serial number. Then, but it's a George Lucas film from nineteen seventy-one, and this is early George Lucas because it's pre-Star Wars. Robert Duvall's in it. Donald Pleasance is in it. Now I've heard of this film, but I've never actually seen it. Um. So Ray says about it, another film that George Lucas um, tinkered with after many years and added CGI, which sit quite strangely in this obviously low-budget film. Across of Brave New World and 1984 and Logan's Run, which came out after it, so quite a few different ones in there. So not that original, but some, some self-consciously art, but so self-consciously arty that I enjoy it for that reason. It couldn't be any further from Star Wars. It's more like a European art house movie, but at the same time feels very American. Very interesting. As I said, that's one I'll have to put down to watch. Ray's number 38 from 1971 is THX11. 38 by George Lucas and my number 37 is Gattaca a, a 90s film from 97 another film I did on the show debut film from Andrew Neal I think he's had a mixed career since this is probably his best film it's set in a future where the government determine through like individuals DNA who is essentially fit from to go into space so we have a young Ethan Hawke and his character is is basically sort of discriminated against because of his genetics. Um, so probably not too far fetched when you consider the way things are going. And he hatches a a plot with a disabled character played by Jude Law, um, and he offers Vincent, that's the Hawk character, his identity to so that he can achieve his dreams. But also because it's a dream of the the other character, kind of then he they can both sort of, in effect, achieve their dreams through him. So we get this really detailed process of them, like, the Jude Law character, not the Jude, sorry, the Ethan Hawke, scrubbing down and making sure he looks identical to the other character. And it, it's fascinating stuff. You have Uma Thurman on good form as the love interest who starts to suspect something over time, and a murder plot involved as well, which casts shades on their investigation or their plan. Alan Arkin brilliantly cast as the detective. So it has that sort of noir thriller type thing in with the sci fi. Again, it's very slow burning, very stylish. I think the three leads are really, really well cast, perfectly cast. Um, there's good depth to it, some really great ideas, and plenty of tension and, as I said, effective style. Some more good music, this time from Michael Nyman. And it's very underrated. It's a gem you should all check out. Gattaca from 97 is my 37. And we'll do Ray's 37 before going to a bit of music. And he's gone for a Ridley Scott one, one of his more recent films, The Martian, 
which I still haven't seen. I hear great things. Um, but Ridley Scott's so up and down, but this is said to be one of his better recent films. So a big cast, Matt Damon, Sean Bean, he probably dies because he dies in everything. <laughs> Jeff Daniels, Jessica Chastain, um, Chichafel, Edge of Thought, Chris... Christian Wiggs in it, Benedict Wong, everyone's in it. Um, from 2015, man stranded on Mars and has to survive for nearly two years while they send a shuttle up to rescue him. He grows potatoes in his own his own poo. Paul, is that meant? Is that po- no? It's right. Okay, I had to question myself, and then has to figure out a way to get another site where right, where there is a shuttle which has to be used on a future mission, which can take him to the rendezvous point. Um, I love the w- the use of the word poo. Um, <laughs> manages to maintain the suspense and also seem to be realistic depiction of that. It might be like that. To be stranded on Mars. Very well said, Ray. And yeah, get in touch if you like The Martian as well. It's Ray's number 37. So continuing the lists, um, my number 36, something a bit different this time, Reanimator from 1985. So this is Stu- Stuart Gordon's cult classic, sort of a pulpy, campy um, science fiction mixed with horror. Obviously, a, a neat little twist on the Frankenstein's monster-style story. Um, there's also a nice little prestige to the horror theme tune with Richard Band's um, opera- operatic main theme. Um, and it's a lot of um, really good characters. You have Jeffrey Coombs on tremendous form. He's like the ultimate oddball, like mad scientist. Um, really interesting character in the way he drifts between the good and the bad, sort of good and evil. Barbara Crampton, one of the most iconic scream queens um, in, in, in the main female role. And she's one of those. She really owns up to that. She's really not shied away from appearing in more horrors over the years. She's very very good, as always. You have excellent practical effects. And the ending is just unforgettable. It's both shocking and hilarious all at the same time. A lot of black humour mixed in with this this um, really dramatic horror and sci-fi plot. But it's a lot of fun. It's always very entertaining when I re-watch it. Um, and actually, fun fact, there's a character early on in the film, the scientist who comes up with this whole um, t- technology, he's called Hans Gruber, making him the second Hans Gruber in the 1980s film, and actually the first, if you're going in order, because obviously Alan Rickman appeared as the diehard Hans Gruber later on in 1988. So a fun little fact for you. There's a Hans Gruber in Reanimator as well. Um, and it's really underrated. It comes from... Uh, sorry, I'm reading the previous one. But it probably is underrated, to be fair. <laughs> um, but if you're a genre fan, you're going to know it. It's going to be a biggie for genre fans. It's from a H.P. Lovecraft novel. He's one of the biggies when it comes to this sort of fiction so that's reanimator my 36 ray's 36 he's gone back to spielberg again um it's ai as in artificial intelligence from 2001 so right before minority report which ray had at 40 um so Haley joe Osmond, Osman, jude law robin williams william hurt in it so solid cast again and this would be of particular interest to Ray because it's a film that Stanley Kubrick and Spielberg were, were going to make together, I'm assuming, before um, Kubrick's um, death. Based on Brian Adas' short story called Super Toys Last All Summer Long. Indeed they do. <laughs> it's a retelling of the Pinocchio story about a robot boy who can feel love and who wants to be loved by his mother who rejects him. Once you've had me, you'll never want a, a real man again, is, is a line he's picked from the film. So Ray obviously really likes it. It's number 36. Again, I've not seen it. Uh, it's sort of one of those with Spielberg, particularly in his later era... I do find some of his films a little bit sort of mawkish, a little bit, you know, kind of 
overly sentimental. And I, I wonder if this might be one that fits into that category. But Ray, Ray likes it a lot, clearly. It's his number 36. My number 35 um, is Moon, a more recent film from 2009. Um, so this is Sam Rockwell in sort of a breakout performance from him. He plays Sam Bell, who's a man who experiences a personal crisis nearing the end of a three-year space mission, realising he may not be alone. And Moon's one of those tricky films to talk about without really spoiling the plot. And I think the reveal happens about midway through, so probably... Yeah, I better not say it. I think it may be a bit too late into the film. Yeah, I, I won't spoil it. But it's the debut by Duncan Jones, who many people might know is the son of David Bowie, and one how of a debut it was as well. So it's this very low-key, thought-provoking movie, slowly paced, very character-driven, obviously, because it's mostly like the one character. I mean, that's what's so impressive about Rockwell's performance, the way he holds it together, and it's just him for most of the film. Has this really chilling, unique atmosphere. Again, it's this stripped-back sort of sci-fi of ideas. Really beautiful moments. At times, it's a very touching film. It sort of touches on themes of communication and man's distance from the world. Rockwell is is re really great. It's sort of the film that really brought him to attention. Kevin Spacey plays like the sort of voice of the computer, the Hell-style computer, and he does a really good job in that. I really like the music. Clint Marcel's score is really good. Um, and Jones might be hard-pressed to top it. In fact, he's struggled since. I liked his next film, which was another science fiction um, called Source Code, which was sort of a, a, a sort of a twist on like the matter of life, life and death type plot. I really like that, but he has been up and down since Moon. But Moon's really great. You, you should you should check it out. So Moon is my thirty-five, and Ray's number thirty-five, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and there's sort of. Well, there's many versions, but I guess there's two which people tend to talk about the most. There's the 56 one, and then there's the 78. Ray's gone for the 1956 one. So Kevin McCarthy, Dana Wyatt, King Donovan, quite the name, and Car Caroline Jones. So, I mean, Ray sort of... Um, sort of tricks us it here the way he starts because he says terrible dialogue, second rate idea which isn't properly developed. What happens to the originals and later in the film we see someone fall asleep and change and the seed pod isn't even needed at all. Ray, what are you doing here? You're supposed to like this film. But then he turns it around on us. Um, he says should have been a second rate B movie but it isn't. Something li lifts it above that and it works really well. Metaphor for consumerism, but actually could be a metaphor for religion or small town American life. Seed pods which contain aliens grow to the exact replicas of people in a small town and then take over their bodies when they sleep. Um, hero and heroine have to stay awake for the entire duration. So they have it. Ray's description and, yeah, re I mean, it's a really interesting story, the invasion of the body. Very inferential and I cannot reveal. The 56th film might appear on my list. It might not. The 78th film might appear on my list. It may not. My lips are sealed. But that's Ray's number 35. And my number 35. For another quite recent film, Children of Men from 2006. So we have Ferronzo Caron, sort of no stranger to the sci fi genre. He made a, a big impact with his film Gravity a while back, another but very different sci fi. This is based on a PG, PD James novel, of all things, set in a dystopian future, 2027. Um, to be exact, which we're not that far away from, when humanity is on the verge of collapse because of reproduction being made illegal for the past two decades. Immigrants seeking asylum to the UK also face brutal 
opposition, so it suddenly feels very contemporary. A subtle and powerful film, in my opinion, really heartbreaking at times, and it depicts kind of the very worst of humanity, but actually also celebrates the very best of it, the way the protagonists band together and support each other and sort of go that extra mile and really sacrifice themselves for their fellow human and sort of for the greater good, if you like, in a very selfish way, rebel against the unjust system and all that. And again, it's another film you think of as being quite a big sort of sort of mainstream film but it is made with a proper heart it's made with real passion and it really goes with its premise it doesn't sort of dumb it down you know for a mainstream audience it is as I said it's really dark at times a really dark vision of the future very gritty I think and there's tension throughout um, with the characters trying to escape with the pregnant immigrant for example brilliantly designed paced and crafted it's 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 a really good film children of men from 2006 my 34 um ray's 34 on the other end of the scale is the terminator james cameron's the terminator so schwarzenegger again appearing tonight at his very best one of his probably his most iconic role to be fair linda hamilton very good ahead of her time for like a female like heroine in in a sci-fi type film action sci-fi and michael bean who plays essentially the one sent from the future to protect her and a really touching bond between those characters i'm sure there will be more on the terminator in the coming weeks but that's raised number 34 uh, my number 33 something a bit different now a bit of a cult gem from Korea this time, it saved the Green Planet from 2003. So I've not talked about this on the show before, so I'll describe it for a few minutes. The film's main character is Bon Her Gon, a man who believes that aliens from um, Adramada are about to attack the Earth and that he is the only one who can prevent them. With his childlike circus performer girlfriend, he kidnaps a, a powerful pharmaceutical executive whom he believes is to be is the top ranking extraterrestrial able to contact the um, Adamadan prince during the upcoming eclipse. So they have it after imprisoning the man in his basement workshop. Bojan pretend or proceeds to torture him so there's this back and forth and it keeps it ambiguous throughout just whether he's right or whether he's being overly paranoid and we find out there's this history so very zany wacky trippy film that could only be pro produced in Asia it has this very nihilistic brutal side it has this sort of twisted black comedy coming on which again can only come out of that. Um, but yeah, oddly, it's very intriguing, has some very interesting humanistic themes as well. It keeps you guessing throughout the film just, just what the truth is. And it has a distinct style and tone. It's one of these rare films you you come out saying, yeah, I've never seen a film like that in my life. It is just insane. But it just works. It, it just beats to the sound of its own drama. It's fantastic. I mean, I love the ending. I think the ending is kind of genius. At times it plays almost like a musical type thing. Um, and I especially love the punk version of Somewhere Over the Rainbow, which the film opens with. Come on, that's awesome. Um, as I said, has a musical-like feel. So many different flavours in there, a really unique mixture of the film, very beautiful and dreamlike with its own kind of logic. Um, and, yeah, keeps you guessing, as I said, striking use of colours, twisted black humour, very unique film. So Save the Green Planet, I highly recommend you seeking it out because it is a bit of a under 
discovered um, gem, although probably very well known in its own country, perhaps. But that's my number 33. So we're on to number... Oh, actually, it's Ray's number 33, which actually I, I considered this. You sort of forget it is a sci-fi, but it, he's gone for the Rocky Horror Picture Show from 1975. That's his 33. I've talked about it many times. Bit of a cult favourite, musical and horror. Um, Tim Curry, Susan Sarandon, Richard O'Brien. Of course, O'Brien did the music. So a film which has stood the de test of time and of obviously the stage version is much beloved too. So the Rocky Horror Picture Show is raised number 33. So on to my number 32. And it's really another good example of a really smart sort of film that went on to become a hit. Um, but an unexpected hit maybe, that is Arrival from only a few years ago to 2016. So in case you don't know much about Arrival, I mean, it's a Dennis Villeneuve film. He appeared on Ray's list last week. He is the director of um, Blade Runner 2049. He directed Arrival a year before that. Um, and the film follows Louise Banks, played by Amy Adams, and she is um, the 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 good. It's um, enlisted by the U.S. Army. Yeah, I couldn't spit it out. U.S. Army to discover a linguist is the word I was aiming for. Um, she's ha hired by the U.S. Army to discover how to communicate with aliens who have arrived on Earth before tensions lead to war. So it's a fascinating idea about kind of the power of language. It, it's stripping that back to its very core elements. Some really fascinating scenes with her m kind of interacting with the aliens who are sort of behind this sort of big screen. Um, makes for some really interesting visual, physical moments. Um, really dives into themes of huma um, humanity, technology, communication, the rest of it, obviously the military um, and their role is, is a big sort of theme. It's a very humanistic sci-fi with some effective sort of back and forth jumping in time so we slowly learn more about her characters and her past as the film progresses. very psychological... And, I mean, I'm not always a fan of films that jump back and forth in time and you get a lot of flashbacks, but I think this is a rare film where the flashbacks actually add to the story and to the character and they really serve their purpose. Um, and I think Banks, you know, gives the, the character gives a refreshingly sort of sensitive take on things. She's a, a really good sort of female character in this sort of a film. At the same time, she's very tough and intelligent. Uh, as I said, the psychology of the whole film is really impressive, really works. Um, Adams is fantastic. She's one of the best working actresses. And she was absolutely robbed of an Oscar nominator. And one of the best performances of that year from one of the best films of the year. I mean, it, it it was ridiculous because she was in that and she was in Nocturnal Animals around the same time. Both were talked up as her getting an Oscar nomination and the Academy ignored both. <laughs> absurd, absurd. Um, I I I I'm trying to think. I I seem to remember the Baftas maybe gave her a nomination for Nocturnal Animals, if I'm correct. But yeah, the Academy. What a choke on that one. Amy Adams is amazing. She's awesome in that film. Again, a lot of it is her. She carries the film with... It's really this rich and layered performance. Impressive effects as well. And it, it again, benefits from being unshowy and low-key. Full of smart ideas, full of suspense. There's care and attention placed into every shot, really. I think Villeneuve is, is one of... The, the most promising current directors. Um, strong supporting cast, Jem Jeremy Renner's in there, Forrest Whitaker, Michael Strumberg, strong supporting cast. Um, it cost about 47 million, it took over 200 million. As I said, a good example of a smart mainstream movie that surprised people. Hollywood, take note of its success, but I love it a lot. Arrival. 
is my number 32 and arrive in at Ray's number 32, <laughs> another recent film actually, Ex Machina from 2014. This is Alex Garland who's been involved in some scripts. Um, he did the novel which The Beach is based on, the Danny Boyle film The Beach. I think he did the screenplay for that. Um, recently did his own, well, another film called um, um, the the names Annihil Annihilation. That's it with Natalie Portman, which was on Netflix, which really worth checking out as well. Um, but yeah, Ex Machina from 2014, Garland film with Don Don Gleeson, Alicia Vikander. I like a lot Os Oscar Isaac, who I also like. I still haven't seen it. It's another one that's on my list to see, but Ray clearly likes it a lot. Um, it's his number 32. So that's Ex Machina, which I know got a lot of buzz. Um, and my number 31 for this part, and my final pick for this part, well, for the first time, and possibly not the last, I'm going Star Trekking across the universe. And it's Star Trek Four. The Voyage Home from 1986. I think for many people, this is one of their favourite Star Trek movies. Um, it's sort of the end of kind of an unofficial trilogy, if you like, because it sort of completes the story which started in The Wrath of Khan and continued in The Search for Spock. Um, this one is actually directed by Leonard Nimoy himself. And it was a nice change in direction after, well, in my opinion, the heavy-handed and melodramatic third film. Um, so intent on returning home to Earth to face trial for their actions in the previous film, the former crew of the Enterprise finds um, the planet in grave danger from an alien probe attempting to contact now-extinct humpback whales. So it's the one where they go to Earth. And it's the whole humpback whales plot. The crew travels to the Earth's past to find whales who can answer the probe's core. Yeah, it's it's absolutely rip roaring fun adventure. As I said, the change in setting is quite refreshing. There's some wonderful fish out of water gags, like the scene with Spot putting putting the Vulcan death grip on a punk rocker on the bus who refuses to turn his music down. He gets a round of applause from that, and I would give him a round of applause too, frankly. Um, there's political savvy, like Cold War chokes, and this is the 80s, remember? So you have Sulu running around asking Americans, have you seen the nuclear vessels, or vessels, as he says? Yes, Sulu, a Russian, is running around America asking that in the 1980s. Well, pr pretty edgy stuff for a Star Trek movies. Um, Catherine Hicks is very likeable as, like, the romantic interest, interesting arc for her character. The film is just full of heart and has some nice character moments. Plus, it has that sort of spectacle you, you would hope from a classic Star Trek adventure. I really like it a lot. It ticks the boxes. It's probably for a comedy Star Trek movie. I think it is the one you're going to go to. But there may be more Star Trek in my list. I do like a good Star Trek movie. We'll see. But that's number 31. Star Trek for The Voyage Home. If you've never seen it, I recommend it. And Ray's number 31 is The Matrix. So another big hitter from 1999, the Rachelsky brothers. So Keanu Reeves, Lawrence Fishburne, Carrie Ann Moss, Hugo Weaving. Pretty impressive cast. It obviously set a new bar for sort of action set pieces. For this sort of science fiction cyberpunk, there's this very cerebral sort of plot. Um, again... Yeah, decent chance it might appear on my list at some time, but it really set a new bar for like the sort of smart science fiction blockbuster. A lot of fascinating ideas in there, brilliant effects as well. That is The Matrix from 1999. That's Ray's 39. Um, so that brings to the end this, well, pretty much the show, but certainly our lists. And we'll return next week um, with our next 10. So we're working our way along. And if things all go to plan, we will end right in time for Christmas on the 19th. 
but that's that's the end of our list. But as I said, we have both picked the TV movie of the week. And Ray's gone for Top Hat from 1932. Uh, I, I suspected he might when I looked at the listings. Um, it's on BBC2, Friday the 29th, and it's at 3.35. And Ray's so on top of things, he's even put the end time, which is 5.15. So just so that you know, top cap, Ray puts classic Fred and Ginger. Fred and Ginger at their best, and no one would disagree with that. So top cap is Ray's TV movie of the week. My TV movie of the week, another quite well-known film, but a totally different film, Taxi Driver from 1976. One of Scorsese's finest, a cult favourite with one of cinema's greatest and most complex um, anti-heroes, played by De Niro, of course, um, that is Tra Travis Bickle. Great supporting cast, a young Jodie Foster, very good. You've got Heidi Cartel in there, Sybil Shepherd, really good supporting cast. But such a unique part of the art movement in Hollywood at the time sort of sharp satire and political themes weaved in. You've got Bernard Herrmann's final score. He died, you know, really as the film was coming out. But it's so distinct, beautiful, dreamlike, really off-kilter, very different, really fits the the sort of uneasy and, and wandering drifter-like theme of the film. Um, it really stands out as one of Scorsese's best, one of the 1970s best. A cult gem, brilliant. Obviously, you've got the Are You Talking To Me scene, so iconic. Brilliant stuff. Taxi Driver, I'm running out of time. You can see it at, at 10 past 1 in the morning on Sony Movies on the 30th of November. So that's my TV movie week. More sci-fi lists next week. Thanks, goodbye. <laughs>